Jim. Pleasure. So I'm Emma at the, the co-op party. Um, I will hand over to your wonderful chair, Jim McMahon, in a minute. Um, but just some housekeeping um, from us in terms of the, the fringe. Thank you for joining us. Um, closed captioning is available. Um, you will find that under the settings if you wish that to be enabled. It's available for this fringe today. Um, this fringe is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to appear on that recording, please turn your video off. Um, it will spotlight on the speakers. But um, yes, it is being recorded. It will be available for people to view publicly afterwards. Um, so if you don't want to appear, then please turn your video off. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping from us. So over to you, Jim. Great. Thank you, Emma. And thank you to you and all the staff team uh, for the work that you've done in pulling together this conference. I think uh, people are invited to so many Zoom calls at the moment. Um, you almost look at your diary uh, going through them thinking how much pain will today be um, when it comes to uh, screen anxiety. Um, this is the one thing that I've been looking forward to now for a number of weeks uh, and the reason for that is not just about local government uh, being where the action is, you know Labour's in opposition uh, nationally but we are delivering on the ground for millions of people uh, in this country uh, but also in my view it's cooperators uh, who are really bridging that divide between uh, politics and the community. You know, that where we marshal resources on the ground, when we bring people together uh, around a common endeavour, where we demonstrate uh, that we will share the collective dividend that comes from that endeavour, then I think people really do rally together. Uh, and although the pandemic has really taken its toll on all of us and every community, um, there is no doubt that in many ways it's doubled down on those areas that were already struggling. The very same areas that had a weak economic base, the areas that felt as though politics had left them behind and didn't provide the answers, uh, and the areas that have been targeted by the Tories through 10 years of austerity. That's meant in many parts of our country, the town centre is weaker, uh, the high streets are weaker, the economic foundation, the jobs that used to provide you know, quality and skill and security for many people uh, have been taken away. And when they look to the future, although they might kind of reconcile what it means for them personally, they are genuinely fearful and angry uh, about what the future means for their children and their grandchildren. And if mainstream politics can't provide the answers to that challenge, then we can't be surprised if people turn their backs on us. Now, my strong belief is cooperation, devolution, local empowerment can really provide the answers. But it can't just be that we shift powers from Whitehall and Westminster down to another disconnected uh, body in a combined authority or a local council. This is about cultural change. It's about how we empower uh, those on the ground to have the freedoms, the power to really engage the community and make a difference. It's about making sure that everybody has a stake in the future and that they co-produce mm. the future rather than having things uh, done to them. And it's also about making sure that that's underpinned by proper resources, because frankly, there is no point at all in having devolution of blame and responsibility if you haven't got the levers and the resources to actually achieve material change that people can see uh, on the ground. What we've seen through devolution, uh, I think, is our metro mayors really stepping up. Uh, we have seen the bridging almost of the soft power and the hard power in quite an inspiring way. Whether that's about making sure that the uh, the buses are fit for the uh, for, for the future, uh, whether it's about making sure that the investment in decent uh, skilled jobs going forward, or whether it's just about campaigning where you see a social injustice and you'll see on the call. Uh, from Liam uh, and others about how you can really kind of tap into where the public are, where people see injustice and they want to know that those who they trust with power are really acknowledging that, but also taking the steps required uh, to put it right. Now we have a fantastic panel uh, today that's been uh, brought together by the COP Party to make sure that we really have a feel uh, for what this can mean across the country, uh, but also that we challenge ourselves to go even further because there is a reason why people on this call are both labour and cooperative. We are absolutely labour, but the cooperation bit is so important. And the mirror that we hold to ourselves all the time is, so in doing what we do, what is the cooperative difference? And that's the test that we apply to everything that we do and every contribution uh, that we make. Uh, so I'm delighted to have Liam Byrne, uh, who's the labour and co-op candidate uh, for the uh, combined authority mayor elections in the West Midlands. Uh, we've got Mark Miata uh, Farnvula uh, from the New Economics Foundation. Uh, who has a long-standing relationship actually with the cooperative movement and was instrumental uh, not many uh, years ago 
uh, with helping the copter really land and mainstream what cooperation can be and actually that there can be an alternative uh, to the way that things were. It won't be status quo, it can't be status quo, but it's for us to determine then what the future is. Uh, and the New Economic Foundation were critical in really landing what doubling the size of the sector will be and how we can really unleash the potential uh, of cooperation. We've got Jesse Joe Jacobs, who's our candidate uh, in the Tees Valley. Uh, and then we have Tracy Braben, who's our candidate uh, in West Yorkshire. All outstanding cooperators, all with real insight, uh, and all hopefully uh, people that you'll enjoy listening to now. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to come over to Liam. Uh, Jim, thanks very much. And um, afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to start with a huge thank you to the Co-op Party in general, but to Jim in particular, because... You know, Jim is somebody who, since he has come into Parliament, has brought this incredible expertise that he has in local government and in the co-op party to really help reset Labour's politics at the national level so that it's a lot more focused now on the kind of practical change that we deliver outside your front door. You know, there's an old saying in this business that action speaks louder than words. And, you know, that is the approach that Jim and the co-op party have really brought to the way that Keir Starmer and his team are now making policy at, at, at the Shadow Cabinet down. So Jim, just a, a huge thank you to you and the co-op team for um, what you're doing in Parliament and, and also everything that you've done um, to help us here in the West Midlands. I just want to say uh, three things really about the challenge that we've got, what the public are saying and what our co-op agenda looks like um, in the West Midlands, um, very much based on a lot of the analysis that the co-op party did for us with a co-op task force for the West Midlands and, and for which we're very grateful. <clears throat> the starting point is what we're going to face this year because this morning I just came off a call that we have every week with Birmingham MPs and the NHS leaders in our city. Goes through the data, goes through vaccinations, goes through testing, goes out, uh, goes through the people who have lost their lives. And what you see are patterns and the patterns that you see is the truth that COVID is not hitting all of us equally. The areas that have been hit hardest in Britain's second city are the places that are poorest. The places where the testing take up is lowest are the places that are poorest. The places where the vaccination rollout is slowest are the places that are poorest. The places that have been hit hardest in this crisis are the places that are poorest and that's why our ambition here in the West Midlands is not simply to win the Metro Mayor and the Police and Crime Commissioner. We want to try and create a Tory-free zone across the West Midlands because it's only doing that that gives us the latitude to really put in place the kind of recovery plan that we need because that's where the politics is now moving. What kind of recovery are we going to have? Are we going to have a recovery that works for some? Those who fared well during the last year uh, those who you know, came out of it with healthy government contracts. Is it going to be a recovery for them? Or is it going to be a recovery for the people that we serve? We're passionate about the latter. And that's why we've spent the last six or seven months in literally thousands and thousands of conversations with the people of our region to try and create a people's plan that helps us put our region on a different course and helps us create a recovery that works for all. No surprise, number one concern, jobs, jobs, jobs. People's anxiety about jobs, the economy, unemployment, absolutely top of the list. Not surprising, we think unemployment in our region could, worst case, go up by 40% this year, back to a level that we last saw uh, during the 1980s. But people are especially concerned about our young people, who they think have really had the rug pulled from under them. You know, so we had the exams fiasco, we've got mental health services in disarray. Um, in our patch, youth services have been cut twice as hard as the national average. Uh, we've got youth unemployment in Birmingham already over 20%. And yesterday, Kate Green and, and Emma Hardy and I met students in our region who told us that they'd frankly just felt like they'd been abandoned during lockdown. Yet this is the generation that we need to succeed and thrive in the years to come. And yet they have been, if anything, hardest done by. The final thing I suppose that people really talk to us about is how much they liked the community spirit that surged forward. People talk to us about getting to know their neighbours by going out and clapping on a Thursday night and then setting up the street-based WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups to make sure that no one on their street or on their estate 
you know, went hungry or, or lonely. People liked that. They want to hold on to it for the future. Now, for the future, people know that we've got to go green, but they worry that we have to recover first and then go green. And they think that that's a dilemma. They don't feel very comfortable about that um, because they don't want to kick the can down the road. The dilemma dissolves when we set out an argument that says, look, we should be making our green future. We should be making the technologies that the world needs to go green. Manufacturing is in the air here. It's in the water. It's what we do. Making the electric vehicles, the zero carbon railways, the jet zeros of the future. That's something that we genuinely think that we can do in radical new ways. But we need to do that in a way that helps our young people get on, bringing together, conquering the fragmentation that bedevils our education system, creating programs like Tomorrow's Engineers and Tomorrow's Artists that creates fast tracks for our young people into those jobs um, of the future. But the foundation on which we build all of that is a richer community life. And that takes us to a really interesting conversation about how we use festivals, markets, culture, sport, to weave the ties of community much closer together. But the co-op ideals are at the absolute heart of that. So we see the mainstay, the lodestar, the constellations that we steer by for our economic strategy as these notions of decarbonizing the economy and community wealth building. So, you know, my ambition is to become the first city region to go net zero carbon. We were the region that led the carbon revolution uh, a couple of hundred years ago. I want us to lead the zero carbon revolution, but I want to do that in a way that allows us to build wealth from the bottom up. Now, what co-op ideas help us do is map how practically we deliver that change. So there are some basics we've got to get right. The campaign for food and food justice, creating food justice networks and the right to food is absolutely first base, making sure that people in our community don't go hungry. If you go to, um, you know, go to any food bank in the West Midlands, go out on the delivery rides, it's all labor people. Um, it reminds me of a book actually that Clem Attlee wrote about actually a hundred years ago uh, called The Social Worker. I keep a, a copy on my on my desk. It's kind of a bit sort of dog-eared and stained, but it was written in, in it was published in 1920. And um, the story is really simple. The story is, if you're a socialist, you believe in society, you believe in society building. That's what we do. And so that return to our roots as the community party, I think is something that really rhymes well with the kind of co-op inspiration that helped give rise to our party um, in the first place. But the right to food, it brings communities together, it brings labour people together, it's first base in terms of turning co-op ideas into practice. Second thing we want to be trying to pioneer is what we call co-op innovation districts, where we take particular parts of our landscape and say, right, how do we bring cooperative approaches together to rejuvenate the economy here and begin rolling back some of the stubborn injustices that scar so much uh, of our region. How do we bring some of the anchor institutions together? How do we bring the players that have got community assets? How do we marry that to using public procurement more wisely to support small and local businesses? We think that we can do that in a way that helps us triple the size of the co-op sector. And then in the green economy, um, Jim, I mean, there are just so many opportunities from the way that we build zero carbon homes to the way that we begin rolling out transport solutions or local and cooperative modes of energy generation. We think that there is going to need to be a phase of experimentation there, but we think it is going to be an immensely important new sector for um, developing co-op solutions from retrofit to energy to transport to house building. And, and this is where we really um, rely so much on uh, the co-op party's expertise. So. You know, I, I was thinking about this morning and I was looking back at some, some really kind of old co-op inspirations and I came across, you know, the quote that was, um, you know, the starting point for many co-op constitutions in, in the last century. And it was the words from uh, Isaiah 41.6, where they said, they helped everyone his neighbour and everyone said to his neighbour, be of good courage. We need courage now. People need courage and communities need courage. But that courage will come from leadership and hope that a different kind of future is possible. That is our political opportunity right now. And with your help, we will turn that into a reality in the West Midlands. I'll stop there, Jim. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Liam. And 
so many really important areas touched on there, but I think what really stood out for me was just a very tangible way in which you're using cooperation to engage people. So the, the commission that you are uh, leading on, but also making sure that you're relating that back to the community with really kind of visible action uh, is so important. So thank you for that. We're now going to move to uh, Miata uh, Fambula from the New Economics Foundation for her speech. Very good afternoon, everyone. Absolutely delighted to be joining you uh, this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, and I will just apologize in advance in case you hear my children screaming in the background. They're absolutely fine. They're just having fun. Um, I think, so listening to Liam, I think the thing that's clear is that this pandemic is being accompanied by an economic crisis, the scale of which we haven't seen for generations. You know, last year, the economy shrunk by 11%, sharpest annual contraction for 300 years. Unemployment is expected to rise to 2.6 million by the middle of this year, if we're lucky, um, probably higher if the economy doesn't start rebounding. And I think any hope of the kind of mythical V-shaped recovery we were talking about uh, last year, I think have been dashed. So we should be in no doubt that we have entered an economic crisis that will be profound and will impact on every single community across the country. And I think the thing that's focusing our minds at the New Economics Foundation is that this comes off the back of and indeed is shining a massive spotlight on deep seated problems that were there with the economy anyway like the fact that the economy wasn't working for so many people. You know, over the last 10 years, for the first time since records began, economic growth did not result in the majority of people being better off. We had a decade in which average wages were stagnant at the same time as the cost of essential things, housing, transport, water, energy were rising. So we had this unprecedented situation going into the pandemic that living standards were on average no higher than they were in 2008, which if you stop and think about it is absolutely staggering. You know, we entered the pandemic with one in three kids already living in poverty, the majority of which were from working households. And so it means that many families, many people are going into what is the worst slump that we have faced for 300 years, with no cushion, with no buffer to weather it. I think it's shining a massive spotlight on how denuded our social protections have become, whether through underinvestment in vital frontline services like health or social care, the stripping away of our social security system, huge cuts to local government, which is absolutely critical for building our resilience and the fabric of our communities. And then I think finally it's shining a massive spotlight on the cost the untold suffering of not preparing properly for this sort of natural crisis, if I can call it that, despite the warnings of the scientists. And you know, for me, the parallels with the climate and the nature crisis is absolutely clear. You know, we've had the warning from scientists for decades, most recently the intergovernmental panel that said in pretty stark terms, we have 12 years to take drastic action to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. And yet our preparedness and our response has been slow and falling significantly short of where it needs to be. So I think the challenge that faces us, the challenge that's facing local leaders, is how do we deal with both the underlying problems that were there anyway, and they're now being compounded by the depths of the crisis that's upon us. And for all these reasons, this is why to me, this feels like a pivotal moment for change. And I think the thing that's really struck me is how quickly this is crystallizing in the public mood and how quickly the debate is shifting. I think the crisis is forging a new consensus for the need for change. The polling suddenly suggests this with, you know, 6% of people only wanting to revert back to the old normal, the overwhelming majority wanting this to be a pivot to something else. And we're seeing this played back across the political spectrum. And so it feels like the political space is opening up for us to forge a new consensus, you know, to use the phrase that's been banded around to build back better. What I am very clear about is that, you know, change of the scale and the nature that's required will, yes, necessitate and require national policy change and national policy interventions, but it won't translate into meaningful change for people and in people's lives unless we have action at the local level. 
And I think there's an increasing realization, including across Whitehall, that to change our economy, you can't just yank levers at the national level and hope for the best. We're not gonna be able to claw our way out of this crisis, which will impact on different communities in different ways, which will require tailored responses without empowering and without equipping partners at the local level in order to be able to respond. So I think the big question for places is, you know, how do you recover from this economic crisis to something better? How do you rebuild your local economies in a way that doesn't just recover to the old normal, but addresses the massive squeeze in living standards we've seen, as well as the climate crisis, which is upon us. And from all the work that you know, we at the New Economics Foundation are doing, have done over the years with many places, we're doing a lot of work with combined authorities and local authorities grappling with this recovery challenge. It strikes me that there are six things that we've got to get right and that we've got to lock into our recovery response. The first is, we've got to focus on living standards rather than simply targeting growth in the hope that that will lift people up. The last 10 years has shown us and has proved that growth on its own is not enough. It is no guarantee that people in our communities will be better off. So you've got to start any economic strategy or any economic development strategy has got to start with how do we improve living standards? And if that is the outcome you're trying to achieve, that will lead you to a different package of interventions, a different package of support than if you were simply targeting GVA. And with the prospects of large scale unemployment looming, supporting the creation of good, secure jobs will have to be part of that mix. I think the second, and Liam's touched on this, is that it does mean future proofing regional and local economies by greening them in a way that is just. And I emphasize the way that is just. We can do the green transition in a way that is hugely unjust. The challenge is to do it in a way that is just. And that's about investing in green infrastructure and technology, yes. Finding targets for the use of renewables across the public sector, its supply chains, using things like planning powers, industry norms, the soft power of the local state to try to decarbonize the economy at the same time as creating good jobs, better paid jobs for local people. I think the third is using the procurement and the investment power of regional local public bodies to boost, boost local jobs and locally owned firms. And that means getting not just the council on board, but other anchor institutions, education institutions, universities, the NHS, to work together to sweat investment across the area, to boost the economy, to create opportunities, and to seek to fundamentally change the nature of the economy. Fourth, and this is the piece that speaks to this critical agenda of trying to democratize economy, it is about finding ways to give people a bigger stake and ownership of their local economy so they have a greater say and agency over it and the benefits of it flow back to them. By supporting community ownership of assets, by supporting employee ownership, cooperatives, and there is a huge role that regional and local government can play. And you know, we've done lots of work with places. There are lots of examples across the world where the local leaders are using the power and the capacity of the local and regional state, its capacity to invest, its capacity to commission in order to build that alternative economy. I think the fifth is that it means a new partnership with local businesses, many of which are fighting for their survival at the moment, that says in return for using the power of the regional and local state absolutely in this moment of crisis, You've got on the other side of this, when we recover, to seek to provide good jobs, living wage jobs, to invest in community and social infrastructure. You know, places were already using things like charters of social responsibility to set expectations of local businesses, using the soft power of local institutions to drive real change. But I think places could go further and introduce harder edge community contracts with businesses in their areas that says, you know, if you commit, uh, which says, you know, you've got to commit to delivering local jobs, investment in community or social goods in return for accessing business support, in return for accessing financial assistance, local assets and uh, facilities. All of these five things are within the gift of local areas now to deliver. They're in the gift of future mayors to deliver. 
But alongside, I think there has to be a sixth, and that is local government at every level, from mayors down, has got to continue to fight to wrestle more power and levers from Whitehall. The pace of devolution has been painful, it's been ad hoc, it's been slow, but it is absolutely imperative for us to get on the path to recovery. And if the government is serious about its leveling up agenda, it has no choice because the set of prescriptions that you're gonna need in London are gonna be different to those that you're gonna need in Northern Tyne and are gonna be different to those that you're gonna need in West Midlands. And I think for the parts of governments that are still resistant to this idea, a year of throwing everything they have at the national level in order to try and resuscitate the economy and seeing that they might get results in some parts of the country, but not others, I think will focus the minds. And for me, that means devolution of discretionary local taxes, as well as funding and new powers over education, skills, employment support, housing, planning, local transport. And this would then equip places with the tools to begin to transform the economy at the pace and the scale that we need to see. Now, the final thing I'd say is this is hard. It's incredibly hard. I think it was a hard ask before the pandemic and the pandemic has made it a hundred times harder as we're having to deal with the uh, fallout. But it feels that for that very reason, that's precisely why we have no choice but to try. Why we have no choice to, but to put aside all political divides, divisions of labor and work across organizational boundaries in an area to respond. To put aside the old rule book and find new creative ways of doing things. And if we don't do this now, then when? No, if we don't do it in response to the biggest economic crisis we have faced for generations that is shaking our foundations to their core, then when? Moments like this, you know, they come once in a few generations. And so we have to do everything we can to ensure that we do build back from this so that there is some light at the end of the darkness of this awful pandemic. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Miata. And, you know, at some point we are going to have to have a conversation, aren't we, uh, both about the relationship between employer and employee. Uh, you know, can, can you really be considered a viable business if you can't afford to pay your staff enough to live on? You know, requiring the state to step in and subsidise uh, wages. We hear a lot of attacking uh, directed at the welfare state, but not so much at corporate welfare. And I do think we need to look at the tax system more generally. It's quite a standout uh, that Jeff uh, Bezos says he's about to stand down. Uh, you know, if he was on the list of uh, the richest countries, I think it was like uh, the 55th um, with 140 other countries lagging behind uh, in terms of his kind of net personal wealth. Uh, and just in the last three months, last quarter, uh, we've seen that the turnover uh, of Amazon of 100 million pound is exactly the same as the UK government has spent on the public health response for the Department for Health and also on the Treasury response uh, to the financial burden. Just one company in three months has made the same as we have spent on that during the whole of the pandemic. So then these are eye-watering numbers, I think, that we need to really think about the structure of the economy, the structure of taxation, and whether people are really retaining the value of what they create uh, in a cooperative way. So thank you for that, we had a very uh, a lot of food for thought in that. Um, and now I'm going to come to uh, Jesse Joe Jacobs, is our candidate in uh, the Tees Valley. Jesse, over to you. Hi, thanks, Jim. And, and actually highlighting Amazon is leads very well into some of the things that that i want to share really because like i think if anything what three months of the profits that amazon has made compared to the destitution and poverty that we're seeing across our communities during this crisis is if there's if there isn't a, a symbol that is that really highlights the problem with our economy, it's that. Uh, and, and in Teesside, what that means is that we've got families and homes with children with no carpets on their floors and no food in their fridges, and no pens and paper to be able to work and do their school work from home, uh, digital exclusion, not enough data to get online. And, and everything that the COVID crisis has, I guess, done is it it's revealed cracks that were already there and it's deepened them and and that's come out time and time again issue upon issue uh, this is just accentuated these problems and and so we have to be the party of hope we have to be the party of solutions we have to be the party that presents a better way 
it, for me, that's presenting a better way for, in the Tees Valley and how we would have dealt with the COVID crisis. And, and then as a party nationally, it's how do we how do we present that that better way? And 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 I'm there's lots of things that I'd like to speak about today, but I'm really keen to to talk about the the alternative business models. Uh, and and that, that's the background that I'm from. I'm a, I'd class myself as a social entrepreneur. I started a charity when I was 24 years old. And, and, and that was because of the gross inequalities that existed in, in Teesside. I met a 15 year old girl who'd been sexually exploited on the streets, uh, that, that she'd gone through the care system. There was not enough help, not enough hope and not enough opportunities for girls in my town. But at the same time, we had huge inequalities because some parts of the town we have, we, we, we've got children who are thriving and succeeding, which is brilliant, but it wasn't shared by everyone. So we went into that and, and I, I guess I approached it with a, a, a business approach in that we would, we would set up an organization, we would raise funds, we'd employ staff, and we would help with some of the most significant and deep rooted issues in, in our society, in our, in our communities. And that led us into homeless support and addiction support and, and having day centers and providing food. And actually we saw very early on into the conservative government, the big shift and, and how or, or already with the changes to the welfare state that people were being penalized and people were coming to us having to decide between heating or eating. And it's just got significantly worse. Um, but, but there is hope. And I think that Liam rightly highlighted some of the things that have come out of this crisis. It's exposed the cracks uh, in, in, the, in the system and the cracks in the issues. It's also exposed the cracks in, in, in hope, in the, the alternatives, in that mutual solidarity, in people standing together. And, and everyone's response to those issues, a really collective response. And every time when, when the government refused to keep feeding children in the holidays. We saw an outpouring of support from our business community, our local charities and local people, and it was phenomenal. And, and that says to me that at our heart, we do care if people go hungry. We do care if people have got carpets on their floor. We do care if children are, be, are being abused and, uh, and, and are safe. And so how do we encourage a shift in, in this, I guess, old system which is all about profits all about mass extraction and how do we and how do we as metro mayors provide leadership for a better way and so one of the things that i'll share a few things that i want to see in the tees valley and and for me like we have to incentivize alternative business startup pure and simply, it has to be easier to start cooperatives. It has to be easier to start social enterprises, easier to start B corporations. Uh, that has to be, if you're a business advisor, you, the, those options should be on the table. They shouldn't be niche. It shouldn't be just, if you wanna start a food kitchen, then there's a little bit of support here. It's like, you wanna start a, a clothing manufacturing company. Well, here's some alternative business models and we should be able to incentivize those business business startup model through through grants, through support. And we I want to have a, a development hub for the Tees Valley uh, called Business for Good, which is is basically finance and port to be able to create these alternative business startups. And, and at the same time, we need to be incentivizing uh, a green economy and a zero carbon economy. And again, that means working strategically with our business partners and with our wealth creators. Uh, we, we have to, it can't just be something that's a nice thing to do. It's not a nice thing to do. Like we are in a significant crisis. The world as we know it is, is changing dramatically in front of our eyes. Uh, it, if, it, we have to call it a crisis as in if your house is on fire, uh, we don't just do some nice little tokens to get that fire out. We take radical and drastic action. And, and that's what has to happen on, on the green agenda. And, and at the same time, we, we have to ensure that places feel, uh, places feel like they're thriving, that, that we have to, at the end of this crisis, what's happened to our high streets 
is just devastating, absolutely devastated. If they were already in decline, we've now seen the, the kind of the button switched and, and a lot of those businesses are gone, a lot of those independent businesses are gone, and a lot of the big nationals are gone. So we've got huge swathes of, of land there that we need alternatives to be able to fill for the future of our communities and our high streets. And so I'd like to see an incentivization of, of repurposing of those spaces. Uh, and again, building on a not-for-profit model to be able to see leisure and tour, like leisure and tourism and learning, public services coming back to our town centre so our town centre becomes a heartbeat again of, of communities and then finally I'll sort of end with this and I think this is and this this has to happen across the board people's voices and people's ability to affect change has to be strengthened uh, I think that what we've seen over the last 10-20 years as well as a decline in living standards as well as gross inequalities we've seen an inequality of power and power has been too centralized for too long but it's also been held even at a local level power hasn't always been shared well and 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 labor local government in some places could be as, as guilty of this at times as, as other places because it's a it's a big cultural shift to start to give away power particularly when you fought for power for so long but I do think that we need to explore those models of citizens uh, citizens assemblies and participatory budgeting ensuring that the people who've got the lived experience of these issues have a say over the future of their communities of their public services and there needs to be tr there needs to be more trust so we have a a, a a more of a cooperative collaborative approach to to providing our services of the future and to rebuilding for for the future and and i do believe that those things at the moment are the small chinks in the in the the armor the small chinks that can become big cracks for change and if we build those and we grow those and we sow those that's when we're going to see radical and transformative change it doesn't always have to come in the huge it can come in the plethora of the small and that's where in amongst the the awfulness of this last year that i'm finding my hope for change Great. Thank you, Jess. And I think a very legitimate challenge there about being really clear about what we mean by giving people power. And I think there is a danger with the Tories that they confuse decentralisation with devolution. So we'll talk about moving the Treasury to the north and having an anchor there. That's definitely not devolution. You're just retaining that centralised power. But equally, devolution isn't localism. Uh, and until we really determined uh, to get it down to neighbourhood level, in the places where people live through their lived experience where they co-produce that together rather than have it done to them then i'm afraid we failed the test haven't we and so it's our job collectively not just to kind of reflect on that but to provide the alternative and i think there's a lot of uh, talent in the cooperative movement to really build that so thank you for that jessa uh, without further ado and certainly uh, no means uh, last but not least uh, is uh, tracy braben uh, of course who you'll know uh, as a sterling cooperator in parliament uh, but now our candidate uh, in west yorkshire Fraser. Well, thank you so much. And um, what an amazing set of speeches to follow. And so pleased to see Jesse Joe on this as well, because we're both pushing at that glass ceiling to be the first female metro mayors in the country. Um, and certainly it's a long time coming. Can I just mention something as well that, that as a member of parliament still currently, I have colleagues say to me, Tracy, why would you want to leave parliament to go into local government? And I just think that's a perfect example of the problem that we have, not just with the Tories, but also with colleagues and with um, politicians who believe that the only big decisions that can be made that can affect real change are made in Whitehall and Westminster. And I think um, as, as Heseltine said a couple of days ago, one of the best jobs in the country surely now must be to to be a Metro Mayor because I absolutely agree with what's been said. This is our ideal opportunity to create massive change that will impact on those who have been served so badly by, by the impact of COVID and the cracks that have appeared in our society and those people who've been harshest and most brutally hit by the impact. And we know that that's the, the um, frontline workers, the, those on minimum uh, uh, income incomes or the freelancers, the gig 
gig economy, you know, they are going from hand to mouth. And of course, they can't afford to self isolate because they don't have any savings. And then uh, for so many, I mean, in West Yorkshire, a, th a thousand in Kirklees. Uh, applications for the support money to self-isolate were turned down. So there are people who can't self-isolate as well because they can't afford to. So we are, um, as others have said, facing an extraordinary moment when it's going to be extremely tough for Metro Mayors, uh, but it is an exciting opportunity uh, to rebuild in a cooperative way so that we have um, real hope and optimism as has just been discussed. And I know that the Labour Party are with us. Um, I think um, what um, uh, has been said, Ed Miliband saying about those, those purpose-driven businesses actually is what we're talking about, is businesses that care about our community, that we will as um, uh, procurers be able to identify and support so that they can contribute to the betterment of our society. But just to say also to uh, underscore um, the, uh, the congratulations to Jim, you know, really leading from the front um, and also the Cooperative Party, um, the work that's been done on um, food banks, on uh, modern day slavery, all of those things are just vital and life changing. And certainly when I was the shadow minister for early years, working with a cooperative party on um, a, a cooperative model for nurseries to build communities and to have um, a, a ownership of your, of your child's education. So that if you're earning that you pay, and if you're not earning, you give time. And I think it's an, a real chance for people to learn the skills of being a better parent as well. So you are really leading from the front and certainly we will be uh, leaning on you to uh, put into place, for, you know, our exciting manifestos. But it is about collaboration. We are going to be Metro mayors that are working with our council leaders who are already doing excellent work and bringing another level of um, um, manifesto commitments and uh, excitement and, and vision for, for our regions. But this is the ideal opportunity to do it. Certainly when our, fertility, uh, um, our death rate is rising and our economies are plummeting, we know that in our communities that gap is widening. We've seen wh whether that's digital divide, free school meals. I was a free school meal kid myself. And I know that I would, if, it, if I was a child now, I'd definitely be one of those children that has no access to the internet or our devices. And uh, one of those children, the 7% of our community of children whose only access to the internet is on their parents' mobile phone or a mobile. You know, that is not how they learn. It's so, uh, a lack of, the, the lack of parity in education is something I think we should all be uh, seeing as incredibly urgent to solve. Um, certainly being um, a raft of cooperative me uh, Metro mayors, I think gives us a whole new opportunity as well. The work that Andy Burnham has done, um, you know, that Liam, ho hopefully we will all get elected and we can work together with that cooperative vision. So that uh, when we go into the um, general elections in 2024, we can say, look at our regions and this is what you will get with a Labour and cooperative government. Um, so, you know, underscoring the need to support Keir and to get him into number 10 as well. We have a, a role to play in that. So, um, like others, I'll also think about, as part of my manifesto as a cooperative commission, to look at how practically we can um, implement cooperative policies in line with the Devo deal and how we build a just and fair recovery to COVID. Uh, food justice, tackling food poverty, um, uh, empowering people through through community ownership of assets and housing. And we've seen good, great practice across the country. Um, I know that Dan has done great stuff in Sheffield. And of course, as I say, Andy and Yorkshire's loads to offer. And, um, you know, we need to build on our strengths and meet the needs and expectations of our diverse community. Um, so what's important is to bring people together um, to uh, be part of that conversation. So the town hall debates, I'll be having a, um, a, a councillor backbench 
uh, committee that will advise me because of course our leaders understand their communities but councillors are really on the ground and really understand the granular uh, problems and solutions for their communities. I've always been a campaigner so I'm definitely going to be a mayor that um, is, is rolling up my sleeves and getting out into communities rather than being in a, you know the glass office uh, and working with cooperators across the region because we know that social enterprises and cooperative business models are more resilient in times of crisis and they offer opportunities for more diversity which is certainly something is very important to me that inclusion and equality that a mayor can actually action with hard power but also the soft power that comes with with a mayor um, also I think we have to really support has been, as has been discussed supporting firms to get excited about maybe you know looking at those um, ownership models employee ownership models developing those online platforms to enable the sector to network and to grow and so we can say you want to your nursery isn't working in this model you can become a cooperative nursery and this is how you do it so we have to have something that can be easy to understand easy to navigate and is supported by our councils. Also, certainly in West Yorkshire, massive cultural heritage and how we can help incubate and grow social um, enterprise and cooperatives in that enterprise. And you'll have seen in Peace Hall in Halifax, the regeneration of that is absolutely built on micro businesses that are ostensibly co-ops because they're owned by a, a small group of people. We can really build on that. Those former mills and industrial buildings repurposed into cooperative businesses and community activity. Also, we know that you won't be surprised that um, as a creative, uh, having spent three decades as an actor and writer, and also when I first started being an actor, being in a cooperative um, acting agency, I know the power of the cooperative movement for um, uh, the creative industries. From actor corps to artist collectives, we can really support our communities coming together with a cultural offer. We've got so much going on and Liam's obviously leading the charge on the Commonwealth Games and the creativity that comes out of that. We've got the Bradford 2023, we've got the Brexit Festival, we've, you know, we've got Leeds, a uh, big festival coming up. This is our, our chance. There is money available to support those cooperative uh, businesses and creatives getting together to deliver something exciting for the community. But it is all about fundamentally community wealth building. We have to keep our pound in our community and we have to make it work extra hard to enable those who've really suffered for the impact of COVID so that they can get back on their feet and so that they can flourish. And we don't allow those loan sharks to prey on people at their most vulnerable time. I am hugely excited by these elections across the country. I, who knows if we are definitely going to get them in May. I, I've been doing a lot of phone banking as you all will have been. And um, the, the mayorality and the elections for mayor haven't quite sunk in yet. People don't really know what a mayor is. They don't really know how it can impact on their lives. So I'm hoping to work with colleagues and the cooperative movement to simplify what it means for you and your community. It means that you will get um, potentially a cooperative bus service that, you know, that can come and take you where you want to go or housing that you can afford or your kids in um, a, a nursery where actually if your income rises and falls, that child doesn't have to come out of nursery. You can just give time. So we have an opportunity to say, actually to really simplify what that mayoral offer is, bringing power to the community with the money to action it. And certainly I say to my colleagues in Westminster, you know, being in opposition is really tough as an opposition MP. To be the mayor, you can actually get things done that will fundamentally change the day-to-day -day lives of our communities. And I am, I'm, you know, so excited and looking forward to hopefully being the Labour and Cooperative West Yorkshire Mayor um, and working with my brilliant colleagues on this call and their fantastic campaigners and clever smart folk in the cooperative party and movement. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. A fantastic uh, contribution now, hopefully, with a fair wind. 
uh, and with people getting on the phones, uh, we can return uh, each of the mayoral candidates uh, whenever the elections do take place. And you're really making a material difference uh, where Labour doesn't currently hold the mayoral offices to show that actually Labour in power uh, can make a material difference. And then if that was complemented by a Labour government, actually making sure you had the resources uh, to implement that change, it'd be fantastic. And you know there is, there is a need for all of us uh, to make sure that our politics uh, looks and sounds and has experience of the whole of our country. Uh, and frankly, it's not good enough that there are more Andes as Metro mayors than there are women uh, representing us at that level. So Liam's going to deal with uh, one of the Andes um, uh, in the West Midlands, but it would be fantastic for Labour to really show that we are reflecting the, the country and bringing forward all of our talent. So very exciting times, uh, I think, for our movement. Uh, so we, we are limited for time. Uh, it's 23 minutes past now. Um, but we should be able to get uh, with uh, kind of snappy questions and snappy answers, uh, three questions in. So I'm going to take the first one uh, from David uh, Breed. Hi there. Um, thanks very much for, for letting me speak. Uh, we really want to sort of pick up on really sort of how much progress people think have been made by sort of particularly the Oxford and Preston councils in actually delivering a localism agenda and particularly focusing their fight they're spending on local businesses and they're making that work. Great, thank you, David. And this kind of local supply chain stuff and making sure you're getting more bang for the public sector book is really, really Absolutely important. Right. So on that, I'm going to ask uh, Liam and Miata to come in on this question. So Liam first, please. We've got a very harsh uh, chair uh, there we go. Right. Sorry, it wasn't letting me unmute. So we've been really inspired by the work in Oxford and Preston. Um, Preston is a, a fairly small place. Uh, the West Midlands is a, is a pretty big place. And so what we uh, have been talking to Preston about is how we do what they've done, but on the scale of an economy of over two million people. Because if we can do it on the scale of the West Midlands, um, you know, I think there are two European countries smaller than us. Um, if we can do it on the scale of the West Midlands, we can definitely do it for Britain. So, you know, we we genuinely want to try and drive this through. And one of the things that we want to uh, to try and do is, I mean, there's lots of small things. Um, so, you know, stupid example, you know, we have hospitals that give their catering contracts to big companies like Break Brothers who ship in curry to Birmingham uh, and then launder the profits in a tax haven. So why why we can't just go to Sparkbrook and procure food from there for our local hospitals, I'm, I'm clear. So, you know, that, so there are lots of little initiatives like that, but the green economy is the big one. So, you know, we genuinely want to be the place that makes the electric vehicles, the zero carbon railways, the jet zeros of the future. And, um, you know, at, at the moment, you know, we're, we're a, a passenger transport authority where, where do you think the vehicles are made? Well, they're not made in the West Midlands. The bikes aren't made in the West Midlands. The, the trams aren't made in the West Midlands. The buses aren't made in the West Midlands. The solutions we're talking about for retrofitting aren't made in the West Midlands. Um, the renewable energy isn't made in the West Midlands. So, so, so there are just kind of entire categories in, in the green economy that we can use the power of public pr procurement to deploy but we have to marry that to an industrial policy that means that we are making the things in the region. And that means doing some significant things around land, uh, around skills, uh, around energy, and around waste and recycling. Um, and those are basically shared platforms that we have to put in place in order to make a reality of this. So we are just so grateful to the work that's been done by Preston and Oxford and, and which the, the co-op party helped us translate into some of the implications for our own economy. And we think we can just try and take this up to, a, you know, the, the next level. And, and frankly, if we can get it to work in the West Midlands, as I say, you know, there's no reason why we can't get it to, to work at the level of the country. Thank you, Liam. Uh, Miata? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I completely agree with that. I think the short answer is um, it's gaining some traction. And I think it's given us a sort of tried and tested me uh, method and model um, that there's a lot of interest. You know, we 
we've been really uh, inspired by the, the number of councils and actually of, of different political persuasions that are increasingly interested in how you use um, the procurement power of public institutions to try and change the nature of um, ownership and models in the economy. But we've got a long way to go. The thing that gives us hope is that we do have examples. You know, you look across to Barcelona, where this has been done on a large scale. We know it can be done. We've got the methodology. It is a question of political will, pick up and just keeping at it, um, but it feels like we're on the precipice of something. Great, th thank you, Miata. Um, the next question uh, we're taking is from Felicity uh, Premru. Thanks very much, Jim, and thank you for this really, really important meeting. It's great to hear from the speakers. And uh, as Miata was saying, we've got these multiple pandemics, climate, uh, economics, racism, and, and um, COVID. Um, and we've got to look at it all as one whole. So my question is, uh, we've been doing a lot of firefighting. We know we need to put out the fire. How are we going to work, especially with local authorities and with our communities and, and very much what Jim was saying about localism for a people's recovery, but also a zero COVID strategy. We've been going along, I think, too much with the, with the government's chaos. They are, you know, they're getting away with, with murder and our lives and livelihoods are just gonna be you know, be, it's going to get worse and worse. And also the thing about climate is also if we don't look at our methods of production, if we don't look at agribusiness, we don't look at destruction, there will be more pandemics. So it's not this magic vaccine, you know, with the Tory cavalry coming over the hill. It's very welcome, but it's one of very many things. We need to get out of this now because the economy will not recover as it will go on for months and even years. And then just secondly, interlinked with that, what are we going to do for a people's vaccine? Because we've been pretty nationalist on this at the moment. It's not going to work. All the rich countries are buying up the vaccines. There's a patent. The poor cannot afford it. And unless we do a global approach and a global solution, not just for justice, but just for everybody's lives, it ain't going to go away. So please, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we really get um, zero COVID and justice. Thank you. That's a pretty fundamental question about how do we stop the narrative of we need to learn lessons when, in, in fact, we never do. <laughs> we kind of repeat the poor behaviour that makes us weaker. Uh, in response to a pandemic. So I'm going to ask uh, Tracy uh, uh, to come in first uh, on that question. Tracy. Yeah, I think that's a really, really powerful question. Um, and certainly I've been, I made an intervention at the weekend saying to government that we need to have a lessons learned review now. It can't be kicked down the road for months time, you know, next year, and then suddenly, oh, apologies for all of that. Actually, the families of those who 100,000 plus, um, uh, you know, people who've sadly died, they want to know what went wrong that meant that the care homes were, were taking in patients with COVID from hospital. They want to know why those masks that cost 15 million pounds were unusable, all those tests that are, un, you know, uh, not 100% um, uh, secure that they want to know why the government was late to lock down why the government didn't um, listen to advice and went ahead with its daft Christmas idea why they opened schools and closed them I mean the government have to answer these questions we can do it swiftly it could take a couple of weeks judge-led inquiry and at least then like you say those lessons can be learned and we don't make those mistakes I would also agree with you about the vaccine we are only as strong as our weakest friend we all need to be aware that the vaccine isn't just something we put our arm around like we're doing, you know, our, our, our test in school. We have to actually share it out and applaud it to um, the uh, Astra, AstraZeneca. They are producing the vaccine at cost for countries. So, you know, we are also edging towards giving, uh, having a parallel distribution to those countries in uh, uh, that are the poorest countries in the world that are impacted by COVID. Uh, certainly, I think, you know, we know how many, I think it's 9 million people in the UK have been vaccinated. It's in the hundreds of thousands in Africa at the moment. We, we can't afford that. And we have to also parallel that with pressure on government to close the border because we won't get zero COVID with a porous, leaky, 
colander border that we've got now. And we're making that case that people need to absolutely be monitored in quarantine. And also we have to be absolute advocates for the poorest in our community who have no choice but to go to work, that they don't want the app on their phone to, to indicate whether they've been um, in, in touch with somebody that had COVID because they don't want to and can't self-isolate. When there are hundreds of thousands in the country with less than a hundred pounds savings, we know so many go from paycheck to paycheck. So on a number of fronts, politically, nationally um, and also locally we must make sure that we learn those lessons we su support the government where where you know where they're doing well but actually we must also call them out when they're making so many fundamental mistakes but i totally agree with you that's what we should be working towards because covid has impacted the the weakest in our society and we are only as strong as i say as our weakest so we must do all we can to to to, to make sure we get to that nirvana of, of no COVID. Thank you, it was a great question. Great, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the next question uh, on my list is from uh, David Shields and we we'll asked uh, Jesse to respond to this question. Uh, David. Thank you, Dave Shields, councillor from Southampton, um, hurting still from last night's score. Um, pace of progress towards devolution post-Brexit is painfully slow in the south of England. So I'd be interested to know what the Labour and Co-op Party vision is for devolution that will benefit of all the English regions. Got some great examples from up north. I'd like to hear what your views are, how we can do this in the south. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And uh, Jesse, to respond, please. Well, I hope that what's happened over the last year in the role of Metro Mayors is an inspiration for everyone in the Labour movement that this is actually a good thing and the Labour Party should, should get behind it. And there has been some scepticism because it's not the full devolution powers that we want and it is restricted, but it's a step towards what we need. We need power to be decentralised. We need power to be closer to the places that those decisions need to be made and 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 we also need that regional voice and the Labour Party I think has, has missed that and in some ways the, the London centric story has become too much of a story for the Labour Party and that needs to completely change and it's also so it's also makes electoral sense and I think what you had and over this crisis and I think very interestingly like Andy Burnham's voice in it for the North uh, that that was a voice that ordinary people northern people really resonated because it was a voice that was standing up for our place and that matters to people it's it, it's powerful and it gives power back and and so i was really pleased to see that that um that gordon brown was brought back in to have conversations about this and keir starmer is is pushing the agenda so uh, the more that we have of that and i think at a local level what clps and what local councillors can be doing is actually having the debate at a local level. I've been part of a few in the northeast because part of the northeast doesn't have devolution powers yet and and so I've been there advocating and I'm sure other metro mayoral candidates would be happy to attend events and metro mayors to speak about about the power of of this role and and I'm and as a Labour Cooperate, cooperate, cooperator. I really, really believe, and we all do, in, in giving people power and ownership. And, and this is such an important way to do that. So I know that we're running out of time, but I hope that that's something that you can take back. So get the debates happening, get, keep, you know, keep speaking up about devolution and we will get there. Great, thank you, Jesse. Um, now we have run over, but I should say we've still got well over 100 on the call. So thank you so much for uh, staying back for that. And thank you to our panellists who uh, all give, I thought, a fantastic insight uh, into the real energy that's going in on the ground to make sure that we succeed and get over the line when the elections uh, take place. But probably more importantly, that when we achieve that victory, that we actually make a material difference for the people that were in politics uh, to, to represent. These are really exciting times. And I think beyond COVID, Listen, when Eric Pickles, who was a former local government secretary, is now in the Lords, uh, but when he was a local government secretary, he went on a mission to completely take away the framework, the scaffolding that supports local communities and local government. Why? Because the rhetoric, uh, the theory was all 1980s Bradford uh, project, where he felt that a council should only meet once a year, hand out the contracts and then go home. 
That's exactly what we've got with this centralised in Tory government, which is why their initial response to a pandemic wasn't to trust the NHS, wasn't to trust local government, wasn't to marshal uh, the, the military in the way that we now see in the vaccination. It was to meet once, give out the contracts, and I think their job was done. And that's a material change now. If we don't succeed, if we don't achieve that power, the people will never have power because that's not what the Tories are in politics for. So thank you so much for giving the time to this. Thank you again uh, to our panellists. Thank you to Emma uh, and the team for pulling this session together, which I hope uh, you found as inspiring as I did. Uh, and have a great day.